Gentlemen, assalamu alaikum. Welcome to the 10th Literary Festival edition. My name is Maryam Saif Khan. I'm a writer, journalist, digital storyteller, and creative writer. I have collaborated with different people from different fields, and I'm very honored to be a part of Literature Festival this year, Literary Festival. Um, today, I'm honored to welcome Jean Babisti Kles from all the way from Paris, France, on behalf of Lahore Literary Festival. He is an yeah. He is an ethnologist, art historian, and curator. He has worked on video game specialization. He has also been working on collections of different objects at Department of Art Objects at the Louvre Museum, Paris. He specializes in contemporary popular culture, video games, and he teaches those also as they evolve. If you have grown up playing video games, Nintendo, you must be familiar with all that language. And he's also worked as uh, for Future Museum in Paris, which was the biggest one as an exhibition of about video games and their connection with culture cinema. As myself, as a 90 kids growing up, I've been playing video games, so this is a very interesting session. So uh, the little background about video games is that it's the industry of billions. We think that it's a waste of time, but this industry has evolved throughout the decades. And please welcome him and as he goes through the presentation. So thank you, thank you for having me here. Uh, so I've been asked today to speak about video games and video games as a new medium. And um, I, am, I used to be a gamer. Uh, I'm still playing a little, but I'm not. Uh, I have too much work at the museum to be gaming as I used to when I was a student. Um, and precisely when I was a student, I was studying art history to become a museum curator. In France, it's a very um, direct path. But I, I, I chose the, um, the specialty of popular culture. And popular culture in France is, is like folk and tradition. And I, I belong to the first generation that took popular culture, like real contemporary popular culture. And I was among the, the, the first few to work on video games, on uh, cosplaying, uh, board games, and all those sorts of um, like comic books, collectors, and stuff. And so I had this opportunity to be one of the first working on the history of video games. This is a field that is now very well established, but when I started working on that, it was 2001. And very, very few people were working on this, and even less in museums. So I studied for my PhD the French community of video game collectors, and they became my friends. And we created together this uh, huge nonprofit co called MO5.com that hosts the largest collection of video games in France. We have 20,000 games, uh, 1,000 machines. By machine, we mean either arcade cabinet, console, portable console, or whatever. And uh, our work is to, to promote the preservation of the digital heritage, um, because there is one digital heritage, and because the, the digital uh, material are fragile, the machines can die, you have to actively work on them to preserve them. What I do at the Louvre every day is curate objects that will never disappear. I work with porcelain. A porcelain, uh, it doesn't move, it doesn't change. Unless you break it, it will be there in 1,000 years. But a portable video game device, if you do not maintain it, if you do not work on the electronics to keep it working, after 10 or 20 years, it is dead. So the, the video game heritage is a, is, an heri is a specific heritage in the sense that you must maintain the technology and you must maintain a backward technology to be able to play it in its original condition. So that's what I've been working on all these years. And uh, I, I, I showed you just some slides uh, where you see the different generations of consoles. Um, so the first Pong, where you just have two um, rackets. 
um, two blocks and one ball bouncing from one to the other. And then here you have the, the first color games, and then very soon Pac-Man, uh, Pac-Man, Pac-Man appear somewhere here. And uh, there, the first Nintendo, it's the, the Japanese version you may not know of because it was just distributed in, in Japan. And all that story that you all have lived, but you, you have to consider that this heritage, the game that you play on Oh, thank you. Uh, the game that you play on this system, if you don't have people to maintain them, they die. And also, uh, you may be familiar, familiar with emulation, meaning having a program that enables you to play on your current computer the old games. But for some very complex technical reasons, when you play an old game on a machine that was not its original machine, you, you lose the speed, you lose the accuracy of the, of the ergonomics of the, of the game, and so you lose part of the real experience of the game. If, you, if you're uh, the best player at the first Mario, you make speedrun. You're familiar with speedrun? It's a practice to take a game and finish it the quickest possible way. And if you're, if you're a speedrunner specialized on the first Nintendo, um, and you try to play the same game with an emulator on the computer, you, you just can't because all the reflex that you have developed, you have developed for the specific interface of the original console. So the view of the video game heritage that we developed in the, in the association is video game heritage playable on the original device with the original screen, so we also maintain CRT screens, so that we can provide to the visitor the original experience of video games. And so that, that's the, the core of our work. And um, to introduce some more complexity, uh, so these are the, the market shares of the different uh, video game system. So as you see, the, the, the console wars that you have seen since you're born, like who is on PC, uh, who is on Xbox or PlayStation, it has always existed just with names that you don't know. I, is there only one person here knowing ZX Spectrum? No, probably not. And, but this was big in France, uh, but much less in the US, but very developed in, in Europe in general. And so this history that you see here, it's an history of three parts. Uh, Europe, meaning France and Great Britain and a little of Germany, Japan and the USA. And all you see here is the interaction of these players uh, these countries where the, um, the machines were developed and the games were developed too. And now this is the, the common way to depict uh, the evolution of video game and it's a very biased one because it tells you the history of video games as just an evolution uh, of the graphics from uh, very simple uh, cubes to uh, real 3D real. But actually, the story is not that one. It's a story of diversification. So uh, I will just show you some slide with the, this, this is the chronology of the types of game. And this one is completely wrong. I, I selected it for that reason. Because you see action games, what an action games means in the 80s when you have big cubes like that, and an action game right now has nothing to do. And so over the time, the categorization of video games changed, change, the type of games that existed changed, but some names remained. And so we have this complexity of history. This is another visualization where, and this, is, is, this one is more right, but it's accurate like today. If I had to draw the same graphic for the 80s or the 90s, I will draw something different. So, uh, as this session is about video, video game as a medium, I really must insist on the historicity of the categories of thinking. When you name something an action game or a strategy game, it doesn't mean the same in uh, 1980, 1990, or 2000, and, or, and even less now. So um, it is very important when we talk about the history of video game to be careful about the, the categories we, we use um, 
and we will see that in the discussion and uh, some other uh, diagram. I mean, every specialist of video game will make a different diagram and no one will agree on these categories. So this is where our field of study has still m a lot to, to structure. It's because our thinking categories are still very unstable and very personal. Also because it's a story that has been written by the actors themselves and the academic field is still very much developing. And uh, another type of classification. And finally, uh, just a view of the first, the world first big exhibition of video game that we made in the Grand Palais, which is the largest venue for exhibition in Paris. And I was the curator of this exhibition 10 years ago. Oh, 11 years ago. Um, and as you see, we choose a very simple uh, style. We wanted to, muse to musealize video games, so showing that they were worthy of being uh, displayed. So we had these very simple colors, and we wanted the, the attention of the public to be focused on the screen, meaning the real media. You see that here you have the, the pad and you can play. You have instructions to play. And in the showcases nearby, we had put comic books, um, film posters, and so on, that were uh, showing the relationship between the aesthetics or the thematics of the video game with the rest of the medium. Because video game is not a, a world that is outside the rest of the popular culture. It's embedded in everything popular. So you, you'll find video game inspired by sci-fi novels, by movies, by everything. So that's what we wanted to show, this embed, um, embeddedness. Wow, that was a really great walkthrough of the video game's evolution. So what was your favorite video game while you were growing up? And what about your organization, MO5, that works on a digital heritage? Uh, would you like to tell the readers and the audience about it? So my, uh, my favorite video game, I had none. I am a specialist of video game because I was deprived of video game when I was a kid. I was forbidden to have some. So the moment I turned adult, the first thing I did was to buy a computer and start playing. So I don't say that my parents did me wrong because um, please do that with, their, with your own kids. I had unlimited budget for books. And if, if I succeeded in life in a way or another, it's because of that. And not saying that video games are toxic, but uh, my parents choose the books and I will do the same for my kids uh, if I can. But still, um, there was this sort of revenge when I was 17, 18, and then I started playing video games. And I've been, since 1997, a StarCraft player, for those oh. who know that game. And I'm still playing StarCraft 2 now online with friends. And uh, I plan to be playing it like forever. It's like being chess player. You never stop chess. Uh, and there is never a new version of chess, but um, <laughs> I mean, StarCraft hasn't evolved a lot. And to answer your second part of your question, uh, our nonprofit, mo5.com, um, is an endeavor we had collectively because the people I, I, I studied for my PhD uh, as an ethnologist. They were collecting these objects with this idea to preserve the heritage of their community because they were geeks or nerds or computer programmers. And they saw that those things they were using when they were kids were going to the dumpsters. They were just thrown away because new things came up. And they, and they had this vision before anyone that this adds value and, this, and that it's not because something is technologically backwarded that it has no cultural value. And they, they, were, they were visionaries, and I loved th their vision. And at the time, I was already uh, a student trained in um, museology, so I knew I could help them because they knew their stuff, and 1,000 times better than I did, but they had no knowledge on how you manage uh, a, a museum facility, how you protect an item, uh, because managing a paper collection is not what you do, 
is not the same as managing a plastic-based collection and so on and so on. So we teamed up and created this nonprofit, and our idea is to build, and that's what we are doing, the base of a future national museum. Meaning, the technology evolves so fast that the administration can't follow. Uh, meaning the time it takes us to adapt our regulations to just hire someone in a new technology is too, too important. So it has to be a non-profit because we, we have no administra administrative constraints. Mm. And so we were managed to build this huge collection. And as we have 450 members now, uh, we exist in, since 2003. Uh, we, we are able to provide a public service. Sorry? Uh, yeah, it, oh, oh wow, <laughs> sorry. Um, uh, so, so our goal is to prepare something for the moment the state is ready to integrate that heritage into the national heritage. But uh, it will take time because we have a lot of people that are used to traditional museums and their, their, their mind is not ready to accept this type of medium. But if we don't act now, the, this will be lost. So that's why we are working and we have engineers, we have electronicians, so we, we manage to maintain that heritage and we do exhibitions, shows. So uh, this one was the largest, it, it was uh, 600 square meters in the, in the most prestigious venue in Paris. But uh, we did such things like three or four times. Most of what we do is uh, shows in place, basically that surface on weekends for school, uh, uh, cultural centers and so on. And uh, we have made like 500 of them already. Like every weekend we have one, more or less. And uh, so our members come here and uh, display the machines and explain them to the people. And we have uh, parents coming with their kids, playing with the, the games of their youth, and their kids showing them their own games. So they, there is a very family-oriented uh, mindset in our endeavor. That was really like... A futuristic approach of bringing the video games and the heri digital heritage into back. Do you think video games would become a part of NFTs or metaverse or that is like not possible? <laughs> okay, so that's the moment we trash NFTs collectively. This is a scam. We are n all aware of that. Are you familiar with NFTs? So it's basically just a bit of blockchain and some people are scamming you, telling you it's worth something. It's not. <laughs> Thank you. I, I'm happy some people support this view. It's quite controversial right now because we, are, we have such a, a, a scene of pseudo-digital art in Paris. Uh, because, you know, there are two types of people who, who do digital art. There are the ones that not know how to code, that have been geek forever, and they know how to do stuff digitally. And then there are some artists that are in classical arts and that decide that they will be digital and they do crappy stuff that has no relationship with digital. And just because they, they, they have the good discourse, their production is accepted as digital art. And so us, as geeks, as defenders of the community of geeks, uh, we have to raise against that abuse. <laughs> um, you, you can't steal the people's money by selling them just a, a screenshot of a video game and telling it's art. That's not how it's done. So, so there, there is so much beauty. There are wonderful games that are real piece of art. I mean, uh, just one that will appeal to your, uh, to, to your local culture. Uh, there is a game called Flower. And uh, it is a big landscape and you are um, a stream of air, and you're passing over flowers and collecting petals, and this is absolutely poetical, and this is beautiful, and you're just piloting your stream. Actually, it's a piloting game, but it's just the, the flower version of it, and there is so much beauty and poetry in it, and this is art for me, and uh, this is how video game can be art. And, and not, not an NFT with, uh, 
with the screenshots. That's so, so no future of video games in AR or virtual reality even then? Okay, oh. this is my second guilty pleasure, trashing AR. So I have a <laughs> video game museum. Um, I have at least six generation of 3D immersive environment in uh, my storage. Never worked, wow. never. Uh, for a very simple reality. Technically, you can do a virtual environment and people put an helmet and they're in the virtual environment. But have you ever been blindfolded? This is a very unpleasant experience. You're panicking because your body sends you, uh, you, you feel the air, you feel what you're touching, but then you're deprived of vision. And this, this separation between your bodily uh, sensation and your vision, it makes you uneasy. And it has always done, been like that with the 3D helmets and stuff. Because you're, you're like feeling vulnerable. You may have noticed that in the 3D uh, VR um, uh, places, they put you in a cage. It's to protect you from, your, from the own fear that you develop by wearing this helmet that blindfolds you. Even if it's immersing you into some complex rendering of whatever environment, you feel, you feel in danger because you, don't, you can't see what's happening around you. So you yeah. And this very sensation that is ingrained in our body, that is ingrained in our brain, because it is a survival instinct of any human being, whatever the country and culture, I think this can't be erased. And that's why I don't believe at all in this 3D environment. The, the current generation will do what the previous has done. They will find their niche, meaning a niche of people fond of this, uh, and probably also some technical niche. I think for, man, for training for maintenance of planes, it's very useful. I've seen they develop that for the maintenance of uh, uh, um, oil platform on sea. There, there are many practical use of that technology. But this idea that we will all in 10 years uh, be completely lost in that uh, 3D rendering uh, second world. Uh, like, remember 10 years ago we had second life and they were saying exactly what they're saying right now about VR. So um, yeah. I don't believe in that. So what are the projects you are working on and has the pandemic shaped or shaped how has that shaped the video games in the present and the future? How does that shape? Yeah, the pandemic, how has that shaped the story? Um, so right now, my projects, um, uh, I, uh, at, at, the Louvre, at the Louvre at least, I am in my current capacity, I'm in charge of Asian art. And so my next project will be on Chinese art. Um, in that regard, digital could be useful in a very specific way. We have albums of Chinese paintings, and these albums, as any paintings, exactly like the Mughal paintings, by the way, are very sensitive to light. Every bit of light they get destroys them, and this is cumulative and irreversible. You put something in the light, it's photons, uh, it's energy getting on the molecules of the paper and destroying the paper. So. Uh, the less we expose this paper artwork, the better they are. And the problem is that we should display our Chinese collection and we, ca and we cannot at the same time because the light is dangerous for the items. So the good solution for us is to digitize the albums and have digital um, um, albums hmm. on site so that we can show the items under glass ceiling with protection and still people can use through digital. So it, it is an, an efficient application of digital because it helps us in, cons in preservation. So um, have you done your dream project or is it in the pipeline with related to the video games and the curation? Well, uh, I, have a, um, I have a project about coins because video game I is a material that you can shape in, in so many contexts. Um, museum exhibitions, it, it's about opportunities. You, you're a specialist of something or you know some, some field, you have access to a collection, and then you must find an angle 
that makes it interesting for the people, and first of all, that makes it interesting for the venue that can host the show, because someone has to pay for an exhibition, and so you must find an, an angle. And so in the forthcoming year, uh, I will have an exhibition of both video games, but other supports like um, um, uh, pinballs. Oh, pinball. And all, all the games that use coins, and why so? Precisely because the, the project, uh, I, I, I created it for a museum that was specialized in coins, and they, 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 they got on the media and said we, they were doing contemporary art and were dissatisfied with the fact that the public of contemporary art was not caring for the coins of their, of their museum. So they, they, they were asking for projects that relate to coins while being on current topics. And I came up with that idea to make an exhibition of playable machines that worked with coins. So arcade cabinets, pinballs, and so people will relive the experience of going inside a cafe or bar. We will reconstitute entire environments like they were in the 80s and 90s in France. And people will, will be given a bucket of, of, of coins and they will enter every room and play with the coins. Uh, the last question and then we will, if, if there are questions from the audience, we can have that. Uh, we are running short of time. Would there be any time in the plausible science fiction world where there will be no video games or the museums? Do you think that will be happening in the 10, 20, 30 years down the lane with no museums or video games as a um, domain? Well, I have a ma in mind a very dystopic scenario where some Russian guy presses the bad button and there will be no museum, no video game, but there will be none of us either. <laughs> uh, this is one scenario. I mean, uh, the question is interesting because why do museums exist? They exist because they represent something. Why does this heritage of video game exist? Because there was this geek community feeling like it belongs to them, it's part of them, and they want it, they want it to live. The museum and the video games will stop existing the moment people won't care about so uh, it's, a, it's about a collective interest for the subject. As long as you have a collective of people interested in art, there will be museums. As long as you have a collective of people interested in video games, you will have them. So when people get bored with w video games, bored with art, um, that would be a very dystopic scenario. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> Thank you so much for a great walk through to the video games world. And if there are any questions from the audience, let us know. Thank you so much for hearing us out and hearing him. Please give a big clap to him. <laughs> any questions? Some teenager boys has took the, uh, killed their own families uh, as they're addicted of the video games. So what is the bad impact of the video games and what is the balance, how to maintain the balance between video games and what type of games should we encourage to the students and the people, to the kids, they should see and play. Bankruptcy now. So your, 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 your question is about what kind of video games I will recommend for the kids. Um, um, that's a difficult question because actually the video games are so diverse now that you have as much choice as you have in books. That's the way. As you have in books. So, so basically... Um, it depends on what you want your kids to be. Uh, meaning, uh, for instance, shooting games, the most violent ones. Uh, it has been studied and, it, and uh, your kids will have less car accidents because when you play those games, you know the ones where you see the gun pointing like that? Actually, you train your eyes to see the menace on the periphery of your vision 
because your opponents always come from the, the, the sides. And so the people that play those games have less car accidents because their lateral vision is overdeveloped. So it develops one skill. Uh, if, you, if you play uh, reflex games, your, your kids will develop reflex. If you play strategical games, uh, they, they will play strategy. But the fact is you, can, you cannot force it on, on kids. You can forbid them some, game, some games. And obviously, for young kids, I will advise to, to, to set aside, at least for some time, uh, the shooting games because kids don't need that. Uh, I mean, there are already too many guns in the world. And uh, it's funny as an, as an adult, because you, kn you know what it means, and so you can take some distance from it. And so we, uh, yeah. uh, we are running short of time, so we have to wrap up. Um, you can ask the question in person. Thank you so much for being a great support and audience. Thank you.